Visiting Peru was one of the main objectives for our winter travel in South America this year. We flew over the Andes Mountains from Bolivia to Cusco. Cusco is a high altitude city at 9,800 feet. Even though it was summer, we were dressed in multi layers of clothes to keep warm. Our hostel was right in the center of the historical district of Cusco, with intriguing views of towers and domes from the windows of our room. We found that those towers belonged to the main cathedral, which was just around the corner on the Plaza de Armas, the main square of the city. Always busy, there were intriguing streets leading off into pedestrian areas or small squares of respite. It seemed around every corner there was another plaza with something of interest, such as the lovely Inca Museum, where lots of Peru's history is on display. Even though the altitude of the city made walking an effort, especially going uphill, every street produced a pearl, such as this Quechua woman, or the baby llama, and the Inca stoneworks, stones that fit together so perfectly without mortar are still being used for building foundations. We took the train to Aguas Calientes, the base station for our visit to Machu Picchu. It had been raining a lot. The river cascaded by in more muddy torrents. The road the bus had to take were just as muddy. We were well up in the cloud-shrouded peaks, which just enhanced the mystery of being at this World Heritage Site of Machu Picchu. We hired a guide to take us around the archaeological treasure and to explain the various sections of these mountainous ruins. Machu Picchu was not discovered until 1911. The actual purpose of the site is still a matter of speculation. There are no mentions of Machu Picchu by the conquering Spanish either. Some of the rooms were religious temples, others probably royal residences. There was a whole hillside of agricultural terraces. There is evidence that the chinchilla rat has always resided in the lost kingdom of the Incas, and probably the hummingbird also. It is quite a hike up to the caretaker's hut at the far end of the ruins, but worth it for the iconic view, and of course the photo, of this fabulous place. The modern world moved along through dusty streets, turned into mud baths by the recent rains, but delivering us to the little Inca town of Ollantaytambo, where massive fortresses on the hillside stand guard over the cobblestone village. Inca stones again provide foundations for newer buildings in the old Inca quarters. We found the local market by following these Quechua India ladies. There were the usual veggies with lots of corn and potatoes, bread loaves, and a meat selection, and a little surprise. Olan Taitambo is definitely a tourist destination with plenty of shops featuring local artisan wares. Time to say goodbye and take a tuk-tuk to the bus station. Puno, home to an amazing celebration for the Virgin of Candelaria and this region's most spectacular celebration. Everyone can get into the act and I didn't realize that everyone in Peru could play the panpipes. Banners and bands and dancing groups kept marching through the streets and in front of the cathedral. 
more bands, more dancers, each with fantastic and beautiful dress. Spectators bought jellies and popcorn and empanadas from the street vendors. Everyone can get in the act, and by the afternoon, the teams were starting in on the beer. Young ladies provided a modern contrast to the traditional. After hours of watching this procession, we learned that this is just the dress rehearsal for the real event next weekend. We traveled by bus throughout Peru. The buses were clean and comfortable, and despite some traffic congestion, we got to see a lot of the country, the show off Andes Mountains, or even a herd of llama passing by. Our destination was the valley town of Cajamarca, established in colonial days. It has striking Baroque and Renaissance architecture, such as the Iglesia de San Francisco. As usual, we find the best people watching at the local markets. Now here the lush produce abounded, but the distinctive regional hats were what really caught our eye. Not so much the barbecued guinea pig, however. A tour took us up into the hills for a look at pre-Inca caves and the interesting petroglyphs. Hiking nearby trails, we saw mushrooms growing, then came upon a young man cleaning and sorting them out to dry. He lived in a settlement at the side of the road with typical basic adobe homes, running water, but wood fire cooking. I love the aprons on the ladies. They were cooking up deep fried pork and serving with potatoes for a snack. On the road again, but this time to lower elevations for a change and even across some desert to the little town at Nazca. Nazca is famous for the puzzling array of scratches in the sand, like the graffiti of giants. These can best be seen with overflights in small planes. Ours was a Cessna Turbo 206. Now here are the lines. We could see them, but frankly, we had a really difficult time working out the patterns, even when the pilot told us what to look for. Do you see a tree? Regardless, it was a neat adventure. We also had a look at the Cantallo Aqueducts, ancient stonework spirals leading down to the extensive underground network of reservoirs, some of which are still in use today. Nearby, the Museum de Antonini showcased artifacts from the splendid Nazca culture. Ever onward, our goal was Arequipa, Peru's second largest city and one-time capital. Arequipa sits at the base of a volcano and is known as the White City due to its grand colonial buildings of distinctive stonework. The Plaza de Armas is the city's focal point with its enormous cathedral and other flanking churches like the Iglesia de la Campania, the oldest church with an ornately decorated facade and intricately carved altars. The Santa Catalina Monastery occupies a whole block and is filled with beautiful courtyards and elegant arcades, today featuring the work of Lotus local artists. Our walking tour continued through the older sections of Arequipa to an alpaca wool and weaving center. Here we saw the steps from animal to shearing to the sorting of the wool and spinning of the yard. The weavers were very accomplished. Dropping in at the large city market, we purchased some prime local olives and some fruit for our upcoming bus ride. This time we traveled along the coastline to Trujillo, a town founded by Pizarro 
in 1534, which became a large colonial city. Alas, the city has withered away, but the nearby pyramids of Moche, built way before there were any Incas roaming around, as well as the ancient Chimu metropolis of Chan Chan, captured our interest. At the seaside, we found that the fishermen had traded in hooks and line and now used their fragile looking reed canoe boats for tourist ride. The capital city of Peru is Lima, traffic choked as any major city of seven million people would be. The Plaza de Armas at the city center provide, produced a changing of the guard ceremony at the government palace. On the opposite corner stood a wealth of religious buildings. The Palace of the Archbishop is an elegant example of the neocolonial style of Peru. Adjacent to these lovely rooms is a wonderful museum of beautiful religious artifacts. The main cathedral, from the brilliant floor mosaics up to the intricate mural on the vaulted ceilings is simply spectacular. Also, the cathedral featured a staggering array of side chapels, all hoping to outdo each other in their sumptuous display of beauty. Peru had certainly presented us with a kaleidoscope of enduring memories. <laughs>